Welcome to the real world of virtual reality on the ZSpace platform. What is ZSpace? It's a tabletop virtual reality that's transforming education today. ZSpace functions as your typical Windows PC until you open the ZSpace application and then the magic really begins. Long story short, ZSpace tracks the user's eyewear and stylus in real time, allowing the user to comfortably reach in and interact, move around, dissect, blow up, or change different variables within the environment. Welcome to the real world of
Uh, so welcome everyone, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Pilar Vasquez Vialva and I am the Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services uh, in Morgan, at Morgan Hill Unified School District. Uh, I am uh, a former high school principal um, and I had five career pathways uh, when I was a principal in Chicago Public Schools. And um, after that, I was a director of educational services in a career technical center in Silicon Valley name Silicon Valley CTE. Um, and then now I am serving in a community um, in a district that has career technical education programs. Um, interestingly enough, it's my first um, CTE uh, program um, that I'm leading that has agriculture, which is very new to me. I have never had that before. Um, my first introduction into CTE was back in 2007 uh, when I became uh, an assistant principal, and uh, that was in Glendale, uh, Arizona. Yes, I move around a lot because I believe that there's so much to learn in education and how different systems serve students. Um, and so uh, I was there for about 10 years. It's probably where most of my career has been. And um, carpentry was a huge, the trades were huge um, in the particular district that I was in. So um, that's a little bit about my background and in the different cities and districts that I've served. The, the shortened version of how I ended up, um, I'm originally from Australia, um, involved a ferry ride and uh, putting up my tent next to a gentleman who looked safe and turned out he wasn't so safe because I ended up marrying him. But <laughs> so um, I'm married to Alaskan, which um, has you know forever changed my life, um, moving from an Australian city to a remote community in the uh, interior of Alaska. Um, and also the coldest inhabited town in North America. Um, yesterday, we had 47 um, below, as was our morning temperature. Um, I've been working in CTE for about uh, the last five years. It's been an incredible journey. Um, and I can't really see myself doing anything else at the moment, just because I feel it's an innovative and exciting place to be in, in terms of education. Our population is predominantly Alaska Native. Um, I think uh, statistically 60% of our um, population is Alaska Native, although of the seven schools that I serve, some of the schools are 100% Alaska Native um, students. Um, and Toke is the biggest community that our It was in the mid 90s, I was getting my um, business teacher credential uh, to teach in California. I started at Burbank High School teaching accounting, which is a CTE course. And, um, you know, they used to call it voc ed, voc ed et cetera, ROP, all the different things that um, California had labeled along the way. Um, and I was lucky because there was no other positions anywhere near me at that time the closest was in Las Vegas so I started teaching accounting and it, we happened to have this program called the NAF Academy of Finance at that time and so it was a sequence a path of classes and it included all these other work-based learning pieces and loved that and eventually after a few years I became the director and then taught that class for quite a while. Other CTE courses like computers and so forth, um, you know, how to use Excel and so on. Um, I also was our digital high school grant coordinator and then taught lessons to all of our staff. 
and just continued to kind of get involved in what we would all consider still CTE courses, so with students and staff. And then I decided this program was great, the kids loved it, we needed to expand. And that's when I approached our district office to bring in new pathways and to bring it to the, our other high school as well. And then that's when we added our engineering academy, one for each school, and our medical academy, one at each school. So we have five now. I am totally out of the classroom as a teacher on special assignment as the NAF Academy director for our district. And so I work with the five academies and there's like, when I bring in all the English cohort teachers as well as our, our elective teachers, it's about 33 teachers and about 1100 students. So I, I guess I have two um, answers to this. The bigger picture for me um, in administration is to give appropriate attention to the development of data that um, can inform effective recruitment strategies for me. Um, I think we get tied up in the day-to-day -day kind of running of things and forget to take a step back and make some decisions about recruitment based on um, data. So that is something that I feel in terms of leadership that we should all be looking at. Um, and I, I feel also too that student recruitment is just one component of um, best practice in strategic enrollment management, but it's a really critical piece. So it's important that we get it right. Um, so some of the ways that we recruit uh, for CT here, uh, CTE here is um, things like we have a CTE showcase um, at the end of each year so that students can see um, what is available, the success stories. We do career surveys. Um, the other thing that I pay particular attention to is to make sure that I have a talented and engaged staff team. Um, they're my most precious resource. Um, you know, and as a leader, I feel like I need to do everything feasible to help staff be successful and then that drives uh, the recruitment. Um, and then one of the things that, you know, ZSpace pay, plays a part in, for instance, our CTE showcase. It's available for students coming into the program who want to look at small engines or nursing careers or veterinary sciences to actually um, go, wow, this is really engaging. I get to use this as a tool. Um, but, you know, this answer is very much specific to a, a small rural community and these are some of the strategies that I think it, it, it depends if you're from a comprehensive district. Um, then how you're going to go about recruiting uh, in-house is different than if you're in a center. Uh, when I was in a center, we had 42 schools, high schools that, that we were able to recruit from. Um, and that was very complex, very much to what Jane was saying. We looked at our, our data, we looked at trend data. Um, I was very intentional about looking at demographic population data, who has access to our programs and who doesn't have access to our programs, not just in relation to race and ethnicity, but also in relation to gender uh, and relation to academic status. Um, I found there was some trend data that was very indicative of students who were in AP courses did not have access to our CTE classes. A lot of it had to do with the way master scheduling was done. A lot of it had to do with bias. So um, how, how was it that I was able to get in front of well over 40 different counselors plus 
to inform them of this is what career technical education is and this is what it isn't. Um, in the state of California, in career technical education also became an indicator for uh, college graduation. So it that became a good leverage uh, for us. Um, that being said, um, we also had to recruit the parents. Uh, that became another um, huge piece of it. It's one thing having the programs that kids were going to be interested in. So we did a lot of focus groups. We would do a lot of, um, I mean, we'd have to look at obviously the, the, the workforce and what does that look like, right? Like, are we offering the programs that are going to be uh, sustainable and also be able to provide students an opportunity, a pathway to college, you know, beyond through high school or a program and then college beyond. So that was one piece of it. But then the other piece was talking to parents and educating parents on what, uh, career technical education is. So our systems were multifaceted. It wasn't just about recruiting the student. That was a big piece of it, but it was so far more complex. Um, I find that just because I could speak from both um, from both uh, perspectives, right? From a district and a center, I find that centers, because it's the only thing they have to focus on, they get it. They know how to do it. They know how to do it really well because that's a hundred percent what they could focus on. They they are very strategic with it, and I learned plenty about how to go about it and do it well. When you get into a district and you're recruiting from within, you're competing with teachers who are also teaching electives. You're competing with your AP classes. You're competing with a lot of other stuff that's going on. There's a culture behind career technical education, so you have to educate even with from within. There's union, there's a whole bunch of other aspects that centers obviously don't have to deal with to the degree that a district has to deal with. And so being able to navigate that also creates another complex piece. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but I yeah. recognize that those are the challenges that So it's it's definitely been ongoing. Um, we have a bunch of different ways that we do it. And <clears throat> just a, a little backstory, when we were only 11th and 12th grade, we only recruited from school from and it was only the Business Academy, Academy of Finance, we we call it Business Academy now, um, was only at one school. So we only recruited from our school and nobody really knew about us. Even though we try to work in the community as much, it was just so small one year, the application deadline hit and we had six applicants. That was it. We were like, oh my goodness, and it's such a great program. So now that we have expanded and I've been doing this for so many years, I have so many alumni that come back and work with us. And then we have so many siblings, cousins, friends, neighbors, et cetera, that have heard about us. So that has been a, a really important piece just If anybody's doing any work around uh, educational equity or racial inequities and, and what that all means, the work starts with self, right? And so a lot of this work that I'm most comfortable speaking about now started back in you know 2006, 2007. And so one of the very first things I do is really looking at the data and, and what is the data saying about my students who are um, uh, most vulnerable uh, in the system? And so uh, that's just the very first thing that I, I like somewhat trained myself to just look at. What is the data saying about our students? Who's most served? Who isn't served? And why is that? What is the data saying? Asking a lot of questions. Uh, and then ask, it, there's quantitative data that only says a very small piece of the story. And then there's qualitative data. Uh, and the qualitative data isn't just the data that you get from 
uh, the teachers, it's the data that you get from the students. It's the data that you get from the community partners, as you know, you all know, for those that are, uh, you know, the, especially the teachers, right? Like those partnerships that you have with uh, different folks within your industry. Um, so hearing, uh, just talking to them, I really got engaged in talking to them, talking to the counselors. Um, that started to help me understand what really the mindset was around um, beliefs about kids, uh, beliefs about career technical education. Um, and then that started to help me understand where can I come in and provide some learning around, um, and it's not about career technical education, it's learning around mindsets, beliefs, and core values around children. Um, very different approach as far as a center. I'm talking to you from the perspective of a center. When I went in as a principal, I built out two programs very different as a high school principal doing the work was different i was dealing with different challenges i guess my answer differs in that it is uh, more of a grassroots answer um but it is a, a high priority for my uh, district um that we recruit um especially kind of you know for field work that is a uh, non-traditional occupations you know um with genders that are less than 25 percent of individuals typically employed in the, in those careers um some of the things that we uh do here um is focus perhaps on gender more than the um minority of the alaska native group because that's a given as i said you know with 100 percent of our students being alaska native um we're not targeting recruitment um to them so much although we're very aware of culturally what is appropriate um, in our ct education for our alaska native population but some of the things that we've done have been really successful is um, for instance we've invested in all of our shops to make sure that there is equipment and clothing that is suitable for girls so that they don't walk into the environment feeling like there's not the opportunity to partake. We've got to order you a, a, a you know, special protective gear. Um, we run a, a trip each year for girls to go and look at construction and manufacturing in the cities. Um, we intentionally recruit business owners who have non-traditional employees um, to present to students at our CTE kind of fairs. Um, we have an annual spring CTE day for, just for girls so that we're you know, embracing and welcoming um, difference. And I would say this happened more than in engineering than anything, which was more than ethnic breakdown. I had to look at gender and I had tons of boys interested in engineering and very few women. And so um we we talked on campus about what is it that often will inspire women to go do something and their caregivers fixers etc and so we reframed our kind of our approach and our message when it came to engineering about like you want to build stuff to what kind of problems do you want to solve and how do you want to fix this to help someone you know whether it's making like you know, a robotic arm for medical or building a bridge, you're still helping people, even though you're kind of talking about both of those things. But I, I'm not positive if that's what that reshaping helped, but we, we really have a lot more girls in engineering. The other two are pretty equal. Um, <clears throat> but the same thing is, is this is the fifth year, only the fifth year of our engineering and our medical. So it also could just be that more kids have taken the program and they've talked about it and it's just more known by our community and parents. 